We do welcome each one this evening to the House of the Lord, your gospel evening service. And for those watching online, we do welcome you as well in the Saviour's precious and holy name. We're going to sing a hymn to open tonight, and it is nearer, still nearer, close to thy heart, draw me, my Saviour, so precious thou art. And we're going to sing this together, make it the prayer of our hearts that the Lord would draw us uh, closer to himself. And we're not going to sing it just now, but... In just a wee moment, and we do pray the Lord will just draw near to us tonight and help us to worship him in spirit and in truth. We'll remain seated for this song. going to stand and we're going to seek the face of the Lord, each child of God praying and just stilling our hearts before the Lord, acknowledging our need of him and praying that he will come and meet us in our need. <clears throat> our gracious Lord and our loving, eternal heavenly Father, we bow humbly and reverently before thee this evening, thanking thee, Lord, that thou art God, 
And beside thee there is none else. We praise thee for the way that's been opened for us to come to before thee through the finished work of the Saviour. We thank thee for the merits of our God. We thank thee, Lord, for the blood that was shed on Calvary. It makes us whiter than the snow. It makes us acceptable to stand before a holy God and know that we are welcomed. We thank thee, Lord, for your help today in the service that has already gone into eternity in this house. We thank you for our servant. We thank you, Lord, for the word you gave him. And we pray, Lord, you continue to bless that word, Lord, even as it's watched again on the internet or as the DVDs and CDs go out into homes. That word will not return unto thee void. And likewise, tonight we pray that the word that thou hast given to me will not return unto thee void, but, O oh Lord, it will accomplish that to which thou sent it. We pray, Lord, that you will bless us tonight with a deep sense of thy presence. We do need thee, Lord. We confess that. And we thank thee, Lord, that was promised to be where two or three are gathered together in thy name. And we pray, Lord, you'll be here. We ask you, Lord, that you'll bless those who can't be here, would love to be here. Think of those in sick beds today. Think of those in the house of mourning. Think of those, Lord, caring for loved ones. And we pray, Lord, you will be their portion. Pray, Lord, you'll minister unto them. Remember those, Lord, who uh, uh, would have a desire to be here tonight, but age prohibits them. And they're not able to be in the house of God. We pray for them, Lord. We know that their heart is here. We know, Lord, they would long to be here. And we pray, Lord, that you'll bless those who have been so faithful for so many years. And yet tonight just can't be out. We do pray you'll comfort them and encourage them in the days that lie ahead. Lord, we thank thee for your goodness to us. And allowing us to come to another service. Allowing us to meet together, to fellowship. And to hear the preaching of the word of God. And Lord, we pray you'll take away all distractions tonight. Pray, O oh Lord, that we'll not see or hear as it were anybody else other than the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, with the words of Scripture, we would see Jesus. O oh Lord, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts that will receive thy truth. We do pray for our missionaries tonight across the world. We pray, Lord, that you'll give them help tonight. Comfort them, Lord. We know some are supposed to be home at this time. We pray, Lord, you just encourage them in that extended stay in the mission field. We do remember students tonight. Remember Jonathan, remember Stephen. We pray you'll bless them, Lord, at this time of rest. And we ask you, Lord, as they will commence a new term in the new year, that thou will give them much help and fill them with thy spirit. And, Lord, train them up and use them for thy glory. We do pray for denomination, you'll bless it. Member, moderator, the officers of presbytery, every minister, every elder, Lord, every member of this uh, denomination, we pray that they'll know going on and going through with God. And we'll know what it is to have the Lord breathe upon us once again. Bless our church, Lord. We know the difficulties. We know the difficulties of this moment in time with the curfew and with the restrictions. Uh, Lord, we, we pray in the midst of it all, Lord, thou wilt be pleased to continue to save and restore and to encourage and build up. And even add to our church new families, which we thank you, Lord, you've done in recent days. And we praise you for this. And we pray you'll continue to fill those empty pews. And Lord, we do pray that you'll, Lord undertake for a government lord we know they're not perfect but we are being told to pray for them in scripture and we ask you lord that you will give wisdom lord you will put the right desires into their hearts and lord laws will be passed that will bring glory and honor to thee we pray lord for our own uh, family members for our community for our neighbors for those lord who have no thought of god or certainly have no time for the things of god we pray lord that you will be pleased to work in their hearts and Lord, take down that rebellious heart of stone. And Lord, Lord, break down the, Lord, just the wickedness and the rebellion and the sin that has bound them so long. And we pray, Lord, you'll set them free by the gospel of redeeming grace. Lord, we long to see our loved ones coming with us. We long to see, Lord, so many of our neighbors saved and on their way to church on a Sunday. And we pray, Lord, that you'll be pleased to work in their lives. Give us opportunities to speak to them. Lord, this week, may we have opportunities to speak a word for Christ. And may we have the privilege of being soul winners this week, pointing souls to the Saviour. Bless us in this meeting. Oh, Lord, do our hearts good, we pray. Bless those who are watching online. Oh, may there be signs following the preaching of the word of God. We pray these things for the Saviour's glory and in his precious and holy name. Amen and amen. We invite you to take your copy of the word of God and turn to Acts chapter 11. As you know, we are going through just reading through the book of Acts and their services. And we want to read just some of Acts chapter 11. Just to remind you that the chapter 10 previously, that uh, Cornelius had sent for Peter. Peter had seen the vision 
and he had come and he had seen the Holy Spirit fall upon the Gentiles and many of them were converted by the grace of God and they prayed him to tarry certain days and that's how chapter 10 ends but we're coming now to chapter 11 and the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God and when Peter was come up to Jerusalem they that were of the circumcision contended with him saying thou wentest into men uncircumcised and didst eat with them. But Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning, and expounded it by order unto them, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. The certain vessel descended, as it had been a great sheet, let down from heaven by four corners, and it came even to me. Upon the which, when I had fastened mine eyes, I considered and saw four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And I heard a voice saying unto me, Arise, Peter, slay, and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean hath at any time entered into my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. And this was done three times, and all were drawn up again into heaven. And behold, immediately there were three men already come unto the house where I was, sent from Caesarea unto me. And the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. And he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa, and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them, as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Amen. Just a few things to highlight for you. Verse number two, it says, they that were of the circumcision, or the Jews, contended with him. Now, the word contended is a very strong word. They didn't come to have a little discussion or uh, debate about the matter, but it is a, a word which means to oppose, to doubt, to separate yourself from thoroughly. And the idea really here was that they were coming to speak to Peter. And if they were not happy with the explanation that he was uh, going to bring to them, they were prepared to separate themselves from him and break away from him. This is how angry they were at what had taken place. Now, it's one thing that I was reading a Bible commentary earlier this week, and uh, somebody mentioned there is absolutely no way in the early church that Peter was viewed as infallible because here they were contending with him. They didn't agree with him. And certainly there was never any time where Peter had supremacy over the church. And we know that it's claimed he was the first pope and he was supreme over the church. But that, of course, is not the case. And that's the very evidence there in verse number two. And then it says in verse three, Thou wentest into men uncircumcised Gentiles and didst eat with them. And they were really cross about this. The fact that Peter, who was a Jew, had eaten with Gentiles. But the interesting thing about this is nowhere did the Lord command any Jew to abstain from eating with a Gentile. And the thing that they were getting so excited about and arguing over was actually something that the Lord had never commanded at all. It was a command of man, something that man had made up. So here were uh, Peter and this group of Jewish leaders and they were at odds with each other. And they didn't understand what Peter was doing. And you know, sometimes whenever there's contention or disagreement, confusion about what someone else is doing, the very best thing that you can do is talk about it. Now, sadly today, when people don't understand what someone else is doing, often they murmur or they gossip or they talk behind someone else's back about what are they doing, what do they think they're doing, that's not the right thing to do, rather than going to the person and asking for an explanation. And that's effectively what happened here. And what did Peter do? He gave a plain, simple statement of what happened. And that's from verses 4 to 17. And you will notice as he speaks, he talks about the Lord. 
He talks about the Lord there in verse number nine. The voice answered me again from heaven. Verse number 12, the spirit bade me go with them. Uh, Verse 15, as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them. So we are having the Lord leading and guiding Peter. And as the people sit and listen, oh, well, hold on. The Lord's guided him to do this. The Lord has led him every step of the way. And his great logic at the end was, well, what was I, verse 17, that I could withstand God? Was I going to stand in the way of God's blessing and say it's not for you, you Gentile? No. And the matter was settled, praise God, in verse 18. When they heard these things, the explanation, when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God. And I encourage you, don't make judgments upon what you think you see or upon what you think you know. As a coin has two sides, every situation and circumstance that you view in life has also two sides. And sometimes we're very hasty and make judgments and we make decisions based on what we think we've understood or we know, but rather than asking for an explanation. And when they heard these things, they held their peace. The matter was sorted. And isn't this the way a biblical principle to do? The matter was settled, the situation was left, and God was glorified. And God is glorified whenever his people come together and discuss these things, and whenever we don't hold grudges with one another. And that does mean going speaking to people face to face and discussing things. But isn't it wonderful to be able to say they held their peace and glorified God? May that be true with each of the believers in our fellowship now and in the year in the will of the Lord that lies ahead. Amen. We do want to welcome each one to our service tonight, and we thank you for joining with us at this earlier time, and we do appreciate you accommodating us in this way. Just a few announcements then for the incoming week in the will of the Lord. Because of the curfew, you will know that we are all supposed to be in our houses by 8 p.m. That therefore gives us a problem on Tuesday evening with our Bible study and prayer meeting. So for this week only, we are going to try a Zoom meeting. And that is simply a website on the internet through which we can hold meetings. So if you would like to attend via Zoom, all you have to do is send an email to mfpcpastor at gmail.com. I put that up on Facebook, so you have that there. But it's mfpcpastor at gmail.com saying, I would like to join the prayer meeting, and I'll send you the link. And then on Tuesday evening at 7.30, you click that link, and that will bring you into the meeting. Okay, And you'll be able to see what's going on, and we'll have our time of prayer uh, this week. If anybody's any confusion about that, do... Uh, ring me or ask me or send a message or something and let me know. I'll try and make it as clear as possible. But certainly send an email if you want that link and I'll send the link out by email and that's the easiest way to get it. Thursday evening then at 7pm is the overview of the books of the Bible series uh, which is broadcast on Facebook and Sermon Audio and this week we're in the book of Malachi. And then at 11.15 we're going to have our watch night service. Now that's simply going to be a broadcast uh, but the first night, I don't know, maybe ever in this congregation where there wasn't a watch night service here in the church. And we are going to miss it, but we will be doing a recording probably tomorrow or Tuesday. Get that prepared, maybe a few songs from previous watch night services and make up that little program. It'll be broadcast at 11.15 on Thursday evening in the will of the Lord. Sunday then, next Lord's Day, Sabbath School and Paul's Bible Class, 11. Uh, a.m. to 11.30. 12 noon is family worship with surnames A to L to attend. And then at 7 p.m. in the will of the Lord is a gospel evening service with surnames M to Z to attend. I do want to express our sympathy to those families that have been bereaved. We do remember the Orr family on the passing of Pam, the Espy family on the passing of Billy, the Johnson family on the passing of Bruce, the Todd family on the passing of Billy, the Elliott family on the passing of Tommy and the Wallace family on the passing of Anne. And we do pray for each of these families that they will know God's comfort and strength in the days that lie ahead. We do ask you to pray this week for the work of God in Liberia and servants of God, the Reverend David DeCanio and Miss Joanne Greer, who are serving the Lord out there in Liberia. And then also the work of Bridlington Free Presbyterian Church in Yorkshire in England. And they have no pastor at the minute. So do pray that the Lord will bring them a man of his choosing to lead the flock 
over there. We do trust and pray that you do have a very blessed new year in the will of the Lord, that we'll know much of God's blessing and nearness and building up an encouragement in the days that lie ahead. And we are going into unknown territory, as we always are at any year, but uh, certainly I think we may be understand it a little bit more this year and realize that we've control over very little. How many plans last year did we just have to score out completely uh, or put ahead? And we certainly understand that everything we plan has to be God willing. And that's the way it really ought to be. But there is that lovely song and it says many things about tomorrow. I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow and I know who holds my hand. And is that all that matters going into this year? And do pray for the leadership of our congregation, our elders, our committee. Pray the Lord will give us wisdom as we uh, conduct the business of the congregation for this incoming year. Pray the Lord will give us great leadership, direction and unity. And pray that many precious souls will be won through this congregation and its witness in the year that lies ahead in the will of the Lord. Please do get in contact if you need any pastoral help at any time, morning, noon or night. And certainly I am available and will help you in any way that I possibly can. These are all our announcements to make them subject to the will of the Lord. We're going to sing one more hymn before we come to the preaching of God's word. A lovely old hymn, Revive thy work, O Lord, thy mighty arm make bare. Speak with a voice that wakes the dead and make thy people hear. And maybe there's someone tonight and you need the Lord to revive your heart. Maybe it is, um, verse three is what you need to pray tonight. Revive thy work, O Lord, create soul thirst for thee and hungering for the bread of life. O may my spirit be, or our spirits be. And if that's the case tonight, as we're singing this, just you pray that the Lord will speak to your heart and certainly that we will be able to um, know the Lord's drawing near and reviving us again. We're going to make a start. Everybody knows the first verse in course anyway, and we'll try it together, please. And by the Holy Ghost, our love for thee and thine in flame. Let's sing that final verse together.
Amen. Thank you for singing out. And it's trust and pray that the Lord will come by his spirit and revive our hearts tonight. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter uh, 64. Isaiah 64. <coughs> and we trust that the Lord will speak even as we read his word tonight. Isaiah 64 and verse number one. Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. As when the melting fire burneth, the fire causeth the waters to boil, to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. When thou didst terrible things which we looked not for, thou camest down. The mountains flow down at thy presence. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for them that waiteth for him. Thou madest him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness, those that remember thee in thy ways. Behold, thou art wroth, for we have sinned, and those is continuance, and we, ha and we shall be saved. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. And there is none that calleth upon thy name, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy face from us, and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay, and thou art potter. And we all are the work of thy hand. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for thy truth, for thy word. Write it upon our hearts tonight. Lord, may there be a word in season for each waiting heart. I pray that everyone will leave this house tonight saying, God has spoken to me. The Lord had a message for me tonight. Not the preacher, but the Lord. And we pray, Lord, that you will write thy word and thy truth upon our hearts and make us obedient to it. Lord, empty me of self and sin. Fill me with thy spirit. Give me help to deliver the word of God to the glory of thy name. Oh, make us obedient. Oh, Lord, we pray tonight thou would shred the heavens and come down. Oh, come and meet us tonight, Lord. We pray these things humbly, reverently, and yet believing in the name of our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen and amen. I'm sure you've heard many times in prayer, people praying the words of verse number one of chapter 64. Oh, that thou wouldest drain the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. This was a prayer for intervention from the Lord in a day when everything looked hopeless. Humanly speaking, in the climate of that day, it seemed the enemies of God were in control. The people of God were helpless to do anything to defend the name and the honor of the Lord. Now, in order for us to fully appreciate what the writer is saying, it's necessary to look at the context in which the verse is found. Now, of course, it is in the prophecy of Isaiah. And you, as you know, it's split into 66 chapters, which correlate with the 66 books of the Bible. Isaiah ministered for over 40 years. His name was symbolic of his message. It means Jehovah saves, or Jehovah is salvation, or salvation is Jehovah. It's very similar meaning to the name Joshua. He was called to be God's messenger onto the people. And this message was not always a pleasant message to bring. Yes, there were times that it was a hopeful message, times that they spoke about a savior who was coming. But most of his messages were messages of condemnation, messages about the judgment of God. And he was faithful because he presented the message that God had given him. The key to his ministry is found in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. And I want you to turn to that just for a moment because I think if we understand the background of his ministry, we'll understand a little more of his faithfulness. Verse number 8 of Isaiah 6 said, Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And that's the secret of his message. 
I heard the voice of the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? Isaiah heard God speaking to him. And anybody who has known the Lord speaking to their heart knows what a great blessing that is. And in this particular instance, when Isaiah heard the Lord, he responded to the Lord and said, Here I am, or here am I, send me. But remember the context in which this verse is found. Because not everybody is in the place where they're ready to say to the Lord, whatever you want me to do, wherever you want me to go, Lord, whatever message you have for me, I'm willing to receive it. But let's look at what happened in this chapter. If you look at verse 1, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim, each one had six wings, and with twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. We notice here that Isaiah saw the Lord. And this is important. He saw the Lord. He saw the holiness of the Lord. He saw the power of the Lord. And that made a big impact on him. It affected his heart, his mind, his outlook, and his attitude. You know what he said when he saw the Lord in his holiness and in his glory? He said in verse 5, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. The word undone there, woe is me, for I am undone, it means to be brought to silence. And the thought here is this, he has seen the glory of God. And he realizes his sinfulness. He says here of his lips, but that can also speak of the life. And he sees his sinfulness and he's literally saying, I have no justification for the life I'm living. There's no reason I can put forth for the life I'd be living before a holy God. And he felt ashamed and he felt the guilt. He said he feels unclean. That means defiled or polluted. There's some people think when they stand before God in the day of judgment, they'll have a few things to say to the Lord. No, you'll be struck just like Isaiah. There'll be nothing you can say to justify because there is no justification for living a life of sin. He saw the Lord and as a result, he felt unclean, sinful and guilty before a holy God. Now the Lord has ordained that through the preaching of the word of God, souls would be saved. What is the preaching of the word? It is simply proclaiming what the Lord has revealed to us in his word. We are essentially presenting God before man. That's what preaching is. Presenting God in all his glory, speaking about man in all his sinfulness, speaking about the sufficiency of the Savior, the offer of salvation, the end of a life without Christ, the hope of an eternity with Christ. These things are all being presented. And as the preacher preaches, he is lifting the Lord up before the congregation. It's not about him. It's not about his experience. It's about the Lord. And you will find that there are many people who do not like coming to gospel preaching churches. Why? Because the Lord's lifted up. It makes them uncomfortable, but a sight of God is what is needed today. We must hold him forth as revealed in the Bible. The preacher can't turn around and change the Bible and essentially then try and change the Lord to make him acceptable to the people. But the preacher must preach to the people to repent from their sin, put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that they will be changed to be acceptable before God. Why is there such opposition to truth? Why are there people today running about saying, I'm offended by what you say as a Christian? Why are people so opposed to coming to church or to listening to preaching? It's because the truth and the gospel and biblical preaching all bring a holy God before sinners. And the Bible says, but men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. You know, whenever we seek to reach someone with the gospel and there's a refusal or a rejection, we've all been there, haven't we? Would you like to come to church with me? Or here's a gospel tract. Or can I speak to you about your soul? And the person has rejected you point blank. We can sometimes uh, pray can come in and say, well, if they're not going to listen to me, I'll not be doing that again. But we need to remember here that we are in a spiritual battle. This is a spiritual battle for the souls of men and women, boys and girls. And if you have reached out to someone with the gospel and they've rejected it, remember they're rejecting Christ. 
And your duty and my duty is to go away and to pray and pray and pray and then go back to that person again and do the invitation or give the gospel tract or speak to them about their soul. This is a spiritual battle that we are in. But coming back to Isaiah, here is a man who knew of the holiness of God. He heard the voice of God and he obeyed the will of God. And that description is exactly what we need to find in the people of God again in this day. In you, dear Christian, and in me. We need to be the people who hear the voice of God, obey the will of God, and know something of the holiness of God. You see, there's some Christians today, and they claim the name of Christ by calling themselves a Christian or a believer. And they claim the blood of Christ as a covering for their sin. But they do not honor the holiness of God in their lives or in their worship. They do not listen to or desire to hear the voice of God unless it fits in with their plans for their life. Some people say, well, I'm saved and I'm walking with the Lord. But they're blatantly disobeying some of the commands of God, the revealed will of God in Scripture. I'm in Christ." But they're actually living as if they're in the world. And I need to look at my life and you need to look at your life. And we need to say, am I living the way God wants me to live? And people look at my life. Do they see something of the holiness of God? Do they know something about the Lord? Is Christ seen in me? Isaiah's success was not that he won multitudes of people during his earthly ministry. But Isaiah's success was that he was faithful in the work that God gave him to do. No greater success can there be for a man or a woman or a young person than to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Now I want us to look at some of these verses in Isaiah 61, having thought about the man who presented this prophecy, and I want us to look at this cry for help in desperate times. This cry for help in desperate times. The background, first of all, to the plea. Isaiah lived approximately 700 years before Christ. And that's important to note. Because the plea that is made in this chapter and the prayer that is written in this chapter was a prayer that was going to be prayed about 100 years later, after it had been written. You see, Isaiah not only prophesied of the future events, but he also prophesied about the coming of the Messiah. But he also prophesied about the fact that some of the people of Judah were going to be taken captive by the Babylonians. He warned them if they didn't change their ways, they were going to be defeated by the king of Babylon and the Babylonians were going to carry them all away into captivity in Babylon. Now, at this time, 700 years BC, it didn't seem like a big threat. The king of Babylon, yes, he was a king of that uh, part of the world, but he wasn't a particularly strong king. Babylon didn't seem like a great threat. If they came against Israel or Judah, they could have faced them off, no problem at all. But over the 100 years, they started to grow. And Babylon became a superpower and the king had great strength and as he looked around he wanted to see more land and he wanted to see more people being taken. And he, Isaiah made the prophecy that what was going to happen was the king was going to come in, he was going to siege the, besiege the city, he was going to destroy the temple and he was going to take many people captive under the power of the Babylonians. I want you to turn to uh, 2 Kings chapter 25 to see this actually playing out. And in 2 Kings chapter 25, and this is in the ninth year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, it says, <clears throat> and it came to pass in the, 2 Kings 25 verse 1, it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month and the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came, and he and all his host against Jerusalem, and pitched against it, and they built forts against it, uh, round about it. And the city was besieged unto the eleventh year of king Zedekiah. And on the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine prevailed in the city, and there was no bread for the people of that land. Now note that that was in the ninth year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. 
And they built fortification around the city. And nothing was allowed in and nothing could come out. And therefore it got to the point where there was nothing to eat in the midst of the city. See, Nebuchadnezzar meant business. He was going to defeat these people. And therefore that was in the ninth, uh, ninth year. But if you go down to verse number eight, it says, and in the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, which is the 19th year. And this proves to us that Nebuchadnezzar actually came against Jerusalem and the people of Judah more than once. In fact, there were five times recorded in scripture, he came against them. So this is 10 years later. And we read here that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, uh, came Nebuzar Adan, captain of the guard, a servant of the king of Babylon unto Jerusalem. And he burned the house of the Lord and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem and every great man's house burnt he with fire. And all the army of the Chaldees that were with the captain of the guard break down the walls of Jerusalem round about. Now the rest of the people that were left in the city and the fugitives that fell away to the king of Babylon with the remnant of the multitude did Nebuzar Adan, the captain of the guard, carry away. But the captain of the guard left of the poor of the land to be vine dressers and husband men. So in this time, in the 19th year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, they sacked the city basically. And the temple was destroyed, it was burned with fire. Most of the people were taken away, but the very poorest were allowed to remain, and they were to be farmers and vine dressers and husbandmen. Now, that wasn't for their own keeping, but that food was going to be taken, of course, to Babylon. So here we find that this is the actual account of what happened that is prophesied in Isaiah chapter 64. But how do I know for sure that Isaiah 64 is referring to the events that took place in 2 Kings 25? Well, if you turn back to Isaiah 64, and here's the prophecy, verse number 10, thy holy cities are a wilderness, Zion is a wilderness, Jerusalem is a desolation, our holy and our beautiful house or temple where our fathers praised thee is burned up with fire and all our pleasant things are laid waste. Wilt thou refrain thyself for these things, O Lord? Wilt thou hold thy peace and afflict us very sore? So Nebuchadnezzar had come in and he had ransacked the city. He had taken the people captive and humanly speaking, it seemed to be that one of the enemies of God had got a victory over the Lord and over his people. But John Calvin, in his commentary on this particular passage, says, King Nebuchadnezzar did not possess Jerusalem and was not the conqueror of the nation by his own valor or counsel or good luck, but because God wished to humble his people. God allowed this to happen. God allowed this to happen. God's people were not obedient. They were not faithful. They were not holy. They were not diligent. They were not sincere. And God allowed them to be troubled and brought into captivity to chastise them and change their hearts. And I want you to notice the condition of the people now they're in Babylon. This is the prayer that they're going to be praying. Oh, that thou wouldst rend the heavens and come down. They are now in a position of helplessness. Helplessness. They're in a foreign land, under foreign rule. They're effectively slaves. They can't even <clears throat> come to the place that they used to call home. It's no longer their possession. And this was a situation of their own making. It was disobedience unto the Lord. And humanly speaking, there was nothing that the people could do. They couldn't raise an army up. The Babylonians were too strong. They were too mighty. So what were the people of Israel going to do? Well, they couldn't do anything of themselves. But God. And it's wonderful whenever we come to an end of ourselves and we realize how helpless we are and how little power we actually have and we get on our knees and we seek God. That's always a turning point in a life. You see, we look at our congregation, we look at our community, and we have to be honest that humanly speaking, we cannot save our young people. We cannot fill our meetings. We cannot cause those who are saved to live lives of holiness. We are helpless in this regard, but God is able. We must be faithful in our preparation and organization. We must be faithful in giving God his place in our plans and our works for him. His glory must always be in view as we prepare. His honor must be held forth as we conduct our meetings. And his power 
And his power alone ought to be the strength in which we conduct our ministry. Whether it's in a Sabbath school class or in a youth fellowship meeting or in tots or in the senior, whatever avenue of ministry it is, we must do it in the power of the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ said in John 15, 5, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. So they came to the point where they realize their helplessness. I think this year, if we're honest, maybe God has brought a lot of us to that point. We've made all our plans and we had all our um, things in place for 2020, but how many of those plans had to be put to the side? We started to realize, you know what, just because I make a plan doesn't mean it's going to be followed through. We really don't have much control over anything at all, do we? We really don't have very much power at all. And therefore, we ought to go to the one who's in control of all things. Not only did they realize their helplessness, but they had a desire that God would move. Now, this wasn't a desire they had when they were in Jerusalem. This wasn't a desire they had in Isaiah's day. And that's an interesting thing, because I remember of the children of Israel down there in Egypt. And they worked for years, hundreds of years as slaves, but it wasn't until the end of that period of time, just before they came out of Egypt, that they actually cried unto the Lord. For many years they were quite happy with their lot in life. But these desires were now proper desires. Rather than having my way, rather than being in control of my things, they wanted the Lord to be here. What did they desire? Well, it said there in verse number one, Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. And if you have a pen, you can underline those two words, thy presence. You know why? Because the presence of the Lord makes a difference. That makes a difference in a meeting. That makes a difference in a life. That makes a difference in a marriage. That makes a difference in a community. The presence of God. And there's no greater thing that you or I could pray for, for this congregation, for this preacher, for this each individual here, for every work of this congregation, that we would know the presence of the Lord. Look how far God had to bring them before they requested it. He had to take them hundreds of miles away out of their comfort zone. They had to effectively become slaves and lose their freedom before they started to request the presence of God in their lives. They called themselves the people of God, but they were going through the motions. That's an insult to God to go through the motions. Half-heartedness. In Psalm 37, four, 3 and 4, it says, Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land. And verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. But they didn't trust in the Lord. They didn't do good. And you know what happened? The Lord removed them from where they were. Oh, let us learn. Let us learn the lesson. The background of this plea was that God had to bring them very far out of their comfort zone. He had to make their life difficult and afflicted that they might turn back onto him. Oh, that we would be wise as God's people and realize now is the time to call. Not whenever our back's against the wall, but we need the Lord now. I need him today. I need him more today than I did yesterday, and so do you. Then we have the basis of the plea. How could they call upon the Lord to do such a thing? They insulted him with their false worship. They turned their back on him effectively and were depending on their own strength. How could they dare to turn back and call on the Lord to help them? Well, I believe we have the answer here in verse number three. When thou, or verses two and three, we really need to read. As when the melting fire burneth, the fire causeth the waters to boil, to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. When thou didst terrible things, which we looked not for, Thou camest down, the mountains flow down <clears throat> at thy presence. Now, the Bible commentators are in agreement. Verse number three is talking about that period of time in their plagues of Egypt. They're coming out of Egypt at the Passover. They're crossing the Red Sea. There are miracles done in the desert. The Lord is speaking about, or they are speaking about all those things that the Lord did for their fathers 
in the past, even at Mount Sinai. And that's what that pictorial language is speaking of about the mountains flowing down at thy presence. Remember, the mountains shook and the clouds came down and the people stood in awe and fear in the presence of the Lord as he came to deliver the Ten Commandments on to them. These were things that were unexpected. These were things that they did not look for. But the Lord came down and made clear his power and his provision. Oh, they complained that they had nothing to eat in the wilderness. They didn't ask God for anything. They just complained. And yet God provided for them. And many times that happened. He was there. And you know, if their thoughts were over there in the book of Exodus and what the Lord had done for their fathers in the wilderness, then they would have been very familiar with words such as Exodus 34, 6 and 7. The Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And that will by no means clear the guilty. And effectively, as they're coming before the Lord with this prayer, they're bringing Lord, his word. Lord, look what you did in the past. It's here recorded in your word. Lord, our fathers didn't even look for these things and you poured your spirit out and Lord, you showed your presence and your power. And we're now coming asking you to do it in our day and in our generation. Isn't it wonderful that the Lord does not cast off his people? Yes, he chastises them. Yes, at times he allows us to be discomforted. He allows us at times to be brought to a place where we're in difficulty, that we might cry unto him and come back to him. Oh, but he doesn't cast us off forever. He's merciful. He is long-suffering. And yes, dear believer, you may have failed greatly this week, maybe this year, but you can go back to the Lord and pray for his presence, for his forgiveness, and for his blessing. But they did something else. Not only did they remember the greatness and goodness of God, not only did they plead the mercy of God, but they submitted to the will of God. Look at verse number eight. But now, O Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay and thou art potter. And we all are the work of thy hand. They now prayerfully place themselves into the hand of the potter. Now what's significant about that? The clay has no say over its use. The clay doesn't say to the potter, uh, I would like to be a jug or I'd like to be a plate or whatever. That's ludicrous. So too is the fact that a Christian dictates to God. Oh no, we come before the Lord, we place ourselves in his hand upon the altar of surrender and say, Lord, thy way, not mine. Thy will, not mine. The clay is under the power of the potter. He does with it what he pleases. And that is where the people of God need to be. I need to be there. You need to be there. Lord, I'm the clay. Thou art the potter. Will you make me what you want me to be? And therefore, we, as we seek the Lord's presence and we need his power as we go into another year, we need to remember the greatness of God, his power, his ability, even in our own lives, his salvation. The fact that we're still here today walking with him. We need to plead the promises of God. Call on to me and I will answer thee. And show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. If ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the father may be glorified in the son. We need to place ourselves at God's disposal. And I'll tell you, you see someone who surrenders all. They are the most free person, the most joyful person, and the person whom the Lord can use. Lord, use me to advance thy cause. Lord, make me willing to go through with thee. Lord, while in others thou art calling and using, do not pass me by. And friend, we can be very easily, uh, our minds can be very easily taken to think on other people and what they should be doing or what they should not be doing or but this is a personal thing. I need to be on the altar. I need to be in the potter's wheel, and so do you. Oh, it's easy to find the flaw in other people's lives, but it's hard to lay yourself upon the altar. But praise God when that victory is won, because what a blessing it is to be in the center of the will of God. We've noticed the background to the plea, the basis of the plea. 
But then I want you to think about the blessing from the plea. If you turn with me to the book of Ezra and the chapter number one. <clears throat> Ezra and the chapter number one. And it's just after the book of Second Chronicles, first and second Chronicles, and then the book of Ezra. And it says there <clears throat> now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him an house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel, which is in Jerusalem. And here's the wonderful thing. The Lord heard their cry. The Lord heard their cry. The Lord dealt with the heart of Cyrus. Now, Cyrus was not a Christian. He didn't claim to be a Christian. But God put a desire in his heart that was going to bring great blessing to the believers, to the people of God. And this encourages me, friend. You pray for those in authority over you. Humanly speaking, they're hard. Humanly speaking, they'll not change their mind. But God, God can put the right desires within the heart. And he ordered the rebuilding of the temple. Not only that, he told them, whoever is of that Jewish faith, whoever is of Jerusalem, you can go. Go back to Jerusalem. And we know they went back and they rebuilt the walls and they rebuilt the temple. And that became the religious center for the Jews once again. But the Lord answered above and beyond what they could ever have asked or thought. Because they said, oh, that thou wouldst rend the heavens and come down. And that his presence would be with them. And yes, he did come in a mighty way. In fact, he caused a, a foreign king to finance the building of the temple. He caused the... A uh, city to be rebuilt again, the people to be set free. That's more than they could have ever imagined. But you know, there was a greater answer even to this prayer because they said, Oh, that thou wouldst rend the heavens, that thou wouldst come down. And just within the last number of days, we've been thinking specifically about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ into this world. Friend, way back then, as it were, the heavens were rendered and God became flesh and dwelt among us. And he came down into this world that he might be the saviour of sinners. Redemption came to us through the birth of the Messiah in the Jewish nation. He answered exceeding abundantly above all he could have ever asked or thought. Hasn't the Lord done that with us? Times we've asked small things of God and he's given us great things. He's unchangeable. He is able today to do wonderful things. He is a wonderful God. He is a powerful God. And there's a poem, and I've quoted it before, but I'm quoting it again. It's by Leonard Ravenhill. It's talking about God's storehouse. There are riches in thy storehouse, but my Lord, we are so poor. There is power in the storehouse, but the cripple clothes our door. There is wisdom in thy storehouse, but in ignorance we grope. There's revival in thy storehouse but we've millions without hope. There's freedom in thy storehouse, but my people are so bound. Ah, there's glory in thy storehouse, but it does not shine around. There is love within thy storehouse, but thy people are so dry. There's compassion in thy storehouse, then why, my Saviour, why are our people stony-hearted and our eyes so desert dry? I say to some dear backslider tonight, someone cold at heart, I say lovingly, if you are not in the place of blessing, or if you can think back to better days which were once in the past where you were closer with the Lord, or if you can think back to a time whenever you enjoyed coming to the house of God, friend, the problem has been no lack on God's part. The problem has been with your heart. 
And therefore, we must remember there is nothing that God cannot do or will not do for the spiritual benefit of his people. There is revival, but have you prayed for it? There is power, but have you prayed for it? There's freedom, but have you prayed for it? There's love, but have you prayed for it? And things changed for these people in Babylon. When? When they prayed. And I'm telling you, things will change in your life when you pray. Things will change in the church when God's people pray. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. We thought about the background. They realized their need and they desired God to move. We thought about the basis of the plea. They knew the past works of God. They brought the promises before him. They had the humble position of being the clay and the blessing from the plea. God heard and did greater than they asked. Maybe there's someone tonight in this meeting you're not saved. And your need tonight is that the Lord would rend the heavens and come down into your life and into your heart and to cleanse you from your sin and to wash you in the blood that was shed upon the cross of Calvary. And praise God he can do that. And I'll tell you, every single person in this meeting who's saved will be able to testify tonight. Sinner, if you come and ask the Lord to save you, he'll do more for you than you've asked him to do. Because each of us, when we asked the Lord to save us, we were concerned about our sin, we were concerned about hell, we want to be saved from hell and be sure of heaven and have our guilt forgiven. But oh, how much more the Lord has given to us. Oh, a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Peace that passeth all understanding. A God who walks and talks with his people. Power, wisdom, strength, all for the asking. Oh yes, he does exceeding abundantly above all, all we could ask or think. Is there someone who needs to pray tonight for the Lord to save them? And dear believer, please don't leave this meeting in any spiritual lack or in any spiritual want. We have a God, he's a storehouse that's full, who giveth and giveth and giveth and giveth again. Don't go into tomorrow without asking for all that you need from the hand of God. Praying, O Lord, rend the heavens and come down that I might spend this day in thy presence. Lord, I'm the clay. Thou art the potter. Use me. Make me the person you'd have me to be. May God grant that that will be our attitude as we enter in his will into 2021. Let's unite our hearts together in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee tonight that we have been sitting at the feet of our Savior. Lord, we've been considering tonight what it is to truly, sincerely desire thee to realize our helplessness. Lord, we don't want to stumble along. We don't want to struggle along. Lord, we want to know the blessing of God. Lord, forgive us for the times we've tried to live lives and go through days and weeks and months and maybe even years, Lord, without depending on thee. Lord, the help of man is vain. The strength of man is so feeble. And how foolish for us to walk and try and do our best when the Lord has promised to give his spirit to them that ask him. Lord, we need power. We need revival. Lord, we need love. We need compassion. Lord, we need so much. And we thank thee that there is one in the glory who's able to give. But the testimony so often is you have not because you ask not. Lord, open our lips, we pray. Give us time to pray this week. Lord, take away whenever we come to pray. The devil will give every excuse in the book and every distraction. Lord, give us victory, we pray. That we might pray through to the answer we gain. That we might love thee more, be more like thee, and that our lives might count for eternity. Thank you for every dear saint of God in this place, watching online. Oh, Lord, give us hearts that are burdened to pray. And for any watching or here tonight that's not saved, oh, thank you, Lord, that there's one who's willing and able to save. He's only a prayer away. Give deciding grace tonight, we ask. Save the lost. Set thy people on fire. We pray in Jesus' name and for his eternal glory. Amen.